ಅಖಂಡಂ ಸಚ್ಚಿದಂದಂ ಅವಾಂ ಮನಸಗೋಚರ ಆತ್ಮನ ಅಖಿಲಾಧಾರಂ ಆಶ್ರಯೀಷ್ಟ ಸಿದ್ಧೈ ಐ ಟೇಕ್ ರೆಫ್ಯೂಜ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ದ ಇಂಡಿವಿಸಿಬಲ್ ದ ಎಕ್ಸಿಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ಕಾನ್ಶಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಬ್ಲಿಸ್ ಅಬ್ಸಲ್ಯೂಟ್ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ದ ರೀಚ್ ಆಫ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಥಾಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಸಬ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೇಟಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿ ಅಟೈನ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈ ಚೆರಿಶ್ ಡಿಸೈರ್ so we had a short um, unanticipated gap you remember that we had completed the analysis of the great saying that thou art which uh, sums up the entire or the essence of the teaching of vedanta um we also um, we started the analysis of the statement i am brahman which is which is enlightenment so once we are instructed with that thou art the qualified student who has studied vedanta who knows what is being said who understands the meanings of the words this knowledge should flash that oh oh i am this this is what i am so i am brahman this knowledge flashes that's what we were reading last time in text number 170 and 71 aduna aham brahmasmi iti anubhava vakyartho varnyate now we are going to talk about Uh, the experiential statement i am brahman experiential statement means that's the form of enlightenment what does it feel like to be enlightened the feeling would be or the realization would be i am brahman and then we saw that evam acharyena adhyaropa adhyaropa apavada purasaram that's text number 171 tattvam padartho shodhaitva vakyena So as the teacher with the help of the method of superimposition and desuperimposition um, takes up the statement that thou art and then uh, analyzes the meanings of the meanings of the words the terms that and thou tat and tvam the me- what is the method of analysis the, this analysis is called shodhana what is the method of analysis we realize the essential um, nature of that and thou is pure consciousness existence consciousness place in the non dual reality though because of maya uh, that same non dual reality appears as both god and individual self ishwara and jiva ishwara and jiva are appearances in the absolute um because of maya maya itself is an appearance maya itself does not have any absolute reality uh, i mean one might say that all right so are there four entities now you know um, the absolute reality brahman and maya and jiva and ishwara billions of jiva jivas means sentient beings no sentient beings and ishwara god and all the sentient beings they are nothing other than the absolute reality there is only one right there if you look at the absolute reality then there is only one if you look at water the thousands of waves are just one reality water but yes um all these appearances are coming because of maya so at least you must admit there are two things brahman and maya no you cannot count two things because maya is also at the level of vyavahara transactional reality it does not constitute a second reality apart from brahman just as all the names and forms of the waves do not constitute a second reality apart from water all the varieties of pots do not constitute a second reality apart from the clay you can't what do i mean by that you can't count them although they make an enormous difference you see nobody is denying that the, if you look at the tremendous variety of pottery which you can make out of clay the tremendous variety of an act- activity of waves in the ocean which comes out of water you cannot deny the the significance of it all that the uh, the variety the spectacular show that is put up true but if you keep your as as vedantins you must be strict dry philosophers if you keep your eye on the truth on the reality there is only one reality all throughout in the midst of it and that's the fun the fact that that's what makes the whole thing a movie and that's what makes it bearable and uh, um, you know tolerable and livable you can live through it because you know at in at the depth in reality you are safe it is all right 
whatever is happening at, at the level of the movie, whatever is happening at the level of the surface. So what happens? Akandate avabodhite, once the disciple realizes there's one indivisible reality. Whatever is appearing on the screen, good and bad, comedy and tragedy, whatever the nature of the movie, whatever the special effects, it's all one underlying reality. That's what you call the screen. And you are that. You are the, the ground reality of this universe. Adhikarina, the student must be qualified. So what does, it, what does the student realize? The student realizes, I am Brahman. And he gives a more detailed, you know, like, Aham Nitya Shuddha Buddha Mukta Satya Swabhava Paramananda Ananta Advayam Brahmasmi. I am eternal. I am pure, that means untouched by karma. I am consciousness. I am free. I am ever free. Not that I attain freedom. I always was free. I am free. Um, Satya, I am the reality of this entire universe. Uh, Satya Swabhava. Paramananda, I am all fulfillment. I do not need fulfillment from anyone or anything else. Um, Ananta, I am unlimited. There is no limit to me because I am the infinite. I am that there's the one reality of this entire universe. Advayam, non-dual. There is no second reality apart from this absolute, which I am. Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. This kind of akanda karakarita chitta vritti rudeti. This flash of illumination, chitta vritti. Chitta vritti means modification of the mind. Just like any other knowledge. This is also knowledge, but it's different. How it's different, we will see now next. What is enlightenment? How is it different from other kinds of knowledge? After enlightenment, what happens? Does this enlightening knowledge still persist? So many questions. What's the role of the mind? Is it really through the mind? Then why do you keep saying it's beyond the mind? So on. We'll see all that now. But this kind of knowledge comes. I and mean, this knowledge coming is a clear event. This is what at least we will call it enlightenment. This is described in Advaita Vedanta endlessly. So many masters have attained it. And in other, other uh, you can see it in many, many other traditions, especially the impersonal traditions, many Buddhistic traditions also. There's that breakthrough. In Japan, it's called Satori, a breakthrough moment. Uh, where uh, And once one makes that breakthrough, it is irreversible. It will not go back anymore. Uh, it, it's, you are true. Is everything done in spiritual life? No. If you're already a saint before this, if the mind has been cultivated, then everything is really done. Uh, you, can, you can float uh, and enjoy your pension. But if it's not done, if you're not already a saint to begin with, before this breakthrough, you have to stay with it uh, till it transforms the mind. Uh, transforms the character permanently. So this is enlightenment. Now, multiple questions will arise and many interesting issues will be dealt with. 172, text number 172. Satu chit pratibimba chit pratibimba sahitasati pratyaga bhinnam ajnatam parabrahman vishaykritya tadgata that mental state illumined by reflection of pure consciousness objectifies the Supreme Brahman, unknown but identical with the individual self, and destroys the ignorance pertaining to Brahman. Then just as a cloth is burnt when the threads composing it are burnt, so all the effects of ignorance are destroyed when their cause, ignorance, is destroyed. Hence, the mental state of absolute oneness which forms part of those effects is also destroyed. Okay, a lot here. What exactly happens upon uh, in illumination? Vedantic epistemology, we are asking, is illumination, is it knowledge? If it is knowledge, then what kind of knowledge? And after all, what is knowledge according to Vedanta? What happens when you know anything? So we start with a question about 
what exactly is knowing Brahman? What does it mean? And then we go to the wider question of knowing anything. What does it mean? So we, we are told that first, in order to understand illumination, enlightenment, we must first understand what is knowledge from a Vedantic perspective. What happens when we know anything? This is what happens. There are two components to this. One is that um, when we know something, when I look at a book, for example, what's happening? I focus my eyes on the book, open the book, and I focus my eyes on it, and I pay at attention to it. And what's happening is light is reflected from the book and comes to my eyes, and the optical nerves transmit little bursts of electricity to my brain from there. Somehow this information which is coming in from the world outside, visual information, is presented to the mind. And I'm saying very casually presented to the mind. Nobody has the faintest idea exactly how that happens. Even today, we have a, a pretty good idea and more and more information is coming in as neuroscience develops, as our instruments become more... Um, uh, efficient and finer. What exactly happens when uh, um, you know the neurons fire and uh, the, you know the activities in the nerve cells, in the optical nerves, and then in the brain? What is happening? You can track it very carefully. But what are you tracking? You're tracking bursts of electricity, tiny electrical activity. When does it become? color and shape and letters and meaning and uh, the experience of, I get it, I am reading, I am reading a book. How? How do bursts of electricity do that? Um, no idea, nobody, nobody, nobody has any idea at all. Um, and that is what is ca called the hard problem of consciousness. David Chalmers calls it that. And there are many, many approaches to it. There is a completely reductionist approach. So for example, a famous new, uh, philosopher today, um, Patricia Churchland, she and her husband, I think both are well-known uh, uh, philosophers, philosophers of mind. So her perspective is, uh, I was just reading today, her perspective is, it's neuroscience which is going to explain it. Neuroscience is going to explain how we are conscious, how she does not deny the force of the, the question, how is it that bursts of electricity are becoming um, text and meaning and first person experience? Yes, we don't know yet, but her answer is, it's all neuroscience. And the only way we will know all this is to keep doing more neuroscience. In fact, I read one of her papers. It's part of our reading at the philosophy department at Harvard. And the force of the paper was just this, keep on doing more neuroscience. That's the way you will get an answer to this. So that's the very reductionist approach that it's all brain and it's physical matter, very subtle activity in the brain, but it's entirely physical. On the other hand, uh, you have, um, uh, you know, people like Christoph Koch, uh, David Chalmers and all who say that consciousness is an independent entity and you cannot reduce it just to brain activity. Here, what uh, Vedanta says is, admitted, all of it, you can explain physically, the book outside, light reflected, coming to your eyes, all physical, then to your uh, nervous system and then to the brain. Um, Vedanta does not talk about it, but if you plug in that information, very good, no, no objection to it at all. In principle, Vedanta would not object to it because in principle, according to Vedanta, this is uh, at the level of the Sthula Sharira, which is made of five gross elements, which we read earlier. Five gross elements go to make up the physical body. And then it is transmitted to the subtle body. Here in Vedanta, there is no problem because the subtle body is also matter, according to Vedanta. And this is very interesting. The mind-matter distinction is not accepted in uh, Indian philosophy. In Indian philosophy, you may have a matter consciousness distinction, Prakriti Purusha distinction, but not a mind and matter distinction because mind is also matter, according to Vedanta. Mind is part of the subtle body and uh, the brain is part of the uh, gross body. Stula Sharira, Sukshma Sharira. And there is no difficulty in principle for their interaction, in principle. If you say how, we don't know. Um, but in principle, there is no difficulty in their interaction. So what happens is this information creates a movement in the mind called the chitta vritti. Movement, modification, vritti means modification, just in the yogic sense. 
it's like throwing a stone into a lake. So Swami Vivekananda uses this uh, imagery. Throw a pebble into a lake, it gives rise to concentric circles, you know, ripples. Similarly, the information coming in from outside, uh, is when it finally comes to the mind, the subtle body, the mind itself, it creates a vritti, like a ripple, like a wave. And this ripple, this wave in the lake of the mind is about the information which has come in from the outside world about this physical object, this book. So this is called book form modification, mind modification. In Sanskrit, it would be um, pustaka akara chitta vritti. Chitta vritti, modification of the mind. Akara, of the form. Of the form means having the content. It's not that the vritti itself, the mind itself becomes a book. No, it is about this book. Notice, even in modern science, it's not that the book itself enters your head. That would be, you have to call an ambulance if that happens. It's just light reflected from the book that enters your eyes and nothing else. Uh, and even at that moment, the moment it enters your eyes, it's no longer light. It, the, the, from the cornea and all, it immediately becomes, the image, it immediately is converted into bursts of electricity. Tiny, tiny bursts of electricity. That's all being transmitted through your neurons. Now, uh, that's all that is there in the brain. No light, no, certainly no book or any other object. Now, this information creates, a, it's like a pebble being thrown into the lake of the mind. This is called chitta vritti. And this chitta vritti is always about something. In modern philosophy, it's called intentionality. All thinking is about something. It's thought about, so I have a vritti about the book. This is called book form vritti or chit book akara, pustaka akara vritti in Sanskrit. Now, th then what happens? Remember, consciousness is you, the consciousness, you, the Atman, you are constantly reflected in the mind as reflected consciousness, chidabhasa. Oh. So that reflected consciousness, which is always there in the mind, always shining in the mind, you have this feeling of awareness, which we have all the time, this awareness in the mind, this chidabhasa, reflected consciousness in the mind, it illumines the vritti. It reveals the vritti. What vritti? Book form mental modification. Pustaka akara chitta vritti prakashate. It is illumined by what? Consciousness, not directly. Uh, it is the reflected consciousness in the mind which illumines the content, the, the vritti of it. And then I get the knowledge, I get the awareness. I am seeing a book. It takes me long to say it, but it happens in a flash. And the moment I take my eyes away and look at the screen, another vritti comes up. I'm looking at the computer screen and the, the vritti has changed. My eyes are focusing, new information has come in, a new vritti comes up in the mind. And that one is reflected by the same reflected consciousness in the mind. And I get the knowledge. Now I'm looking at the screen. It is visual perception. The same thing happens for um, auditory perception. The same thing happens for all kinds of perception. The same thing happens for all kinds of internal um, uh, experiences. You need not have perception. It could be a memory. It could be a desire. It could be an emotion. Whatever experience we have, anubhava, experience we have in the world all day long, and even in our dreams, all our waking, all our dreams, whatever, it's a series of exper experiences, yeah. thoughts, perceptions, memories, um, uh, feelings, desires, all of these come and go. Even the ego, that's also an experience. All of these are arising and disappearing. And each case, each of these is a vritti, and that vritti is illumined by reflected consciousness. And we get the knowledge, I know this, I feel this, I remember this. Pain, pleasure, desire, tiredness, energy, curiosity, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, remembering. All of these are vrittis. Without vritti, no experience is possible. Everything must ultimately be dumped into the mind. Then only you can say it's a conscious experience. Otherwise, not possible. Just one aside. Up to this vritti, um, you know, all modern computers, machines, artificial intelligence can mimic to a great extent. Not, I'm not saying they can mimic a subtle body. They can't. But 
Notice how every function, here's a question for uh, consciousness studies. Notice how every function of the mind is now uh, mimicked by, uh, by intelligent machines and computers. Every function. I, I raised this question in the philosophy of mind class and there's really no uh, answer to this. Every function is being mimicked except consciousness. Doesn't that raise a question in our minds and, and modern consciousness studies that consciousness is not just like any other function, like thinking, seeing, willing, uh, creativity. Computers are now, in a way, able to see through sensors. Even an airport door, in a way, sees you when you enter. There's a sensor. So they can see, they can hear. But without the first person experience of seeing, without the first person experience of hearing, there's nobody in there who gets the feeling like we see right now. We are seeing color. We get the feeling of seeing color. We get this feeling of seeing people and uh, activity. All of this, we are getting first person vivid experience inside. Uh, what is it like to see red? The whole classic paper in the history of philosophy of mind. But no computer has that. Vedanta explains why. Modern neuroscience should be puzzled about it. Even creativity. Um, there's this mathematician in Oxford University. Um, I, I met him a couple of years back. His latest book is on the creativity of, of computers. Poems and uh, um, artwork. I, I know one well-known philosopher who says, no, 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 um, that's not really creativity. That's not uh, uh, really you know, intelligence. It's just mimicking creativity or intelligence. But there is a limit to that kind of argument. Then you will have to say everything that the computer is doing is mimicking. Uh, computer memory is not really memory. Computer seeing vision is not really vision. Computer intelligence is not really intelligence. Computer creativity is not really creativity. They, you are in, uh, in a losing argument if you do that. Rather, admit it is creativity, it is intelligence, it is memory, it is far more memory than we can even think about. Uh, it is um, actually computers are able to uh, see, hear, smell, taste, touch in as far as in, insofar as behavior is concerned. But yes, one thing they do not have. Um, one thing that they do not, yeah, do Satoy. Marcus Dusseto, yes. One thing that they do not have um, is first person experience. Now, what is Vedanta's explain, explanation of this? Now you can see. Vedanta's explanation is all of this is possible because these, this is in matter. Vrittis are in matter. Chitta vritti is a movement in the mind and mind is material. And if you can design, if you're clever enough to design machines to see, hear, smell, taste, touch, all the vrittis, if you can copy, if you can mimic, you will get all the behavior, including self-driven cars, um, uh, you know, sophisticated, intelligent behavior, very sophisticated, intelligent behavior. One thing you will not get is uh, the um, first person experience, which we are getting. In those machines, the lights are off. There is nobody home. There is a clear distinction between consciousness, first person experience, and all other mental functions, all other functions, what we talked about, perceptions, memory, uh, creativity, all of these are the level of the mind and you can mimic them. Machines can mimic it can and you can you're free to call it intelligence you're free to call it perception but it is not there is no first person experience there that consciousness being reflected in the mind and generating a first person experience that is not possible unless you can make a mind everything else you can do um, so this first person experience is given by the reflected consciousness in the mind you are pure consciousness you're reflected there and it gives you uh, the feeling of first person experience. So this is knowledge. This is knowledge. Any kind of knowledge. It has two components. The vritti which is generated, ultimately there has to be a vritti, a modification in the mind. 
This is called Vritti Vyapti, technically. Vritti Vyapti. Pervage, literally if I translate into English, pervasion by mind modification, which is unintelligible. It's better to call it simply Vritti Vyapti. Pervasion by the mind. The mind must be focused on the object of knowledge and there must be a Vritti in the mind about that object of knowledge. This much. This is called Vritti Vyapti. What does it do? It destroys ignorance about that knowledge. And parallelly, almost simultaneously, the reflected consciousness, which is always there, your consciousness, you are reflected in the mind, the reflected consciousness reveals that Vritti. And uh, uh, you get the feeling of, I know this, I experience this. This reflected consciousness revealing the Vritti is called Phalabhyapti. Phalabhyapti. Phalabhyapti simply means illumination. Pervasion by reflected consciousness. Knowledge comes because of two things. Knowledge means the knowledge we, we, are, we are having knowledge. This comes of two things. One is Vritti Vyapti, one is Phalab Vyapti. Vritti Vyapti, there must be a mental modification about the object of knowledge created by sense organs or whatever. And the Phalab Vyapti, which is the first person experience, experience of consciously knowing something. That is created, that is the result of the reflected consciousness shining on that Vritti Vyapti. So this Phalab Vyapti, which is, you can call it the resultant illumination. Literally the resultant illumination. Which is, all of this sounds a little dry and abstract. It's not. It's happening to us all the time, right now. So there's a book right here. I'm not looking at it now. It's in the field of my ignorance. This ignorance is called Ajnana. I have ignorance about the book. Now, ignorance about the book is removed the moment I create a Vritti Vyapti. I bring the book, I look at it, and there is a, a wave in the mind about the book. This is called Vritti Vyapti. It removes ignorance about the book, basically focuses my attention on it. And the almost simultaneously, the reflected consciousness in the mind gives me the experience of seeing the book. You know, that first person vivid experience, I am looking at a book. So two things, almost very fast, very sim almost simultaneous, but there's a sequence. First, Vritti Vyapti, what does it do? Destroys ignorance about that particular uh, object of knowledge. How does it do so? By forming a Vritti about it. How is the Vritti formed? In many, many ways, you know, through senses and many ways. And then uh, Phalab Vyapti, which is uh, illumination, revelation, shining forth, the first person experience which we have, which is caused by reflected consciousness in the mind. Uh, these two together give me knowledge. Takes me a long time to speak about it, but it's happening instantane instantaneously, continuously, all the time for us. This is the Vedantic idea about of knowledge, epistemology, Vedantic epistemology. All kinds of conscious experience are like this. In Vedanta experience is always conscious experience. Now, um, what about enlightenment, Brahma Jnana? All sorts of knowledge that we get external by seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, internal by imagining, remembering, creativity, you know, memory, all of these things, all sorts of knowledge, they require Vritti Vyapti, Phalab Vyapti. Vritti Vyapti, Phalab Vyapti, together. What about um, Brahma Jnana? Enlightenment, realization that I am Brahman. So before I give you the answer, let me give you an example. The example is this. I heard it a long time ago in Haridwar. There was a Swami who was teaching Ramananda Saraswati. So he just mentioned a phrase, just a phrase. Oh, Amma Parva Jaisa Hai. Um, and then I asked, what does it mean? He says, that is the, it's a very good example. Um, of explaining what happens in Brahma Jnana, uh, in enlightenment, or as the term is used in Vedanta Sara, Akhandakara Vritti, a Vritti about the one undivided reality. Notice, book Akara Vritti, Vritti is about the book. Akhandakara Vritti, one undivided reality, the Vritti about one undivided reality. Now, the example, first the example, and then we will see uh, how we can apply it to 
our day-to-day life and to enlightenment. The example is this. Normally what happens is sunlight is reflected from the moon and it shines on the earth at night uh, and revealing the things. Suppose the things are in darkness, there is no other light. So we are dependent on moonlight for revealing things. So what's happening? Sunlight reflected from the moon, moon shining on earth, which we call moonlight, though it is actually sunlight. It's not wrong to call it moonlight. We all understand what is meant by moonlight, but it's sunlight reflected from the moon, which we call moonlight and moonlight reveals the earth at night. Exactly like that, Brahman, Atman, consciousness, shining on the mind, lights up the mind. Consciousness is like the sun, mind is like the moon, and earth is like earth, <laughs> our world, our jagat, our samsara. So the mind shining with the light of consciousness reveals the world. The world is hidden in darkness. Wherever the moonlight falls, whatever you use to see, moonlight to see, so that is called, creates a vritti in the mind, where you, whatever you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, the reflected consciousness in the mind reveals it for you. When you have vrittis in the mind, that is vritti vyapti, and the reflected consciousness, like the moonlight, it reveals, it is called phalab vyapti. So the reflected consciousness reveals things at night, a reveal, a reflected consciousness is like the moonlight. The moonlight reveals things in the world. The dark world is illumined at night by the moonlight, though which is actually originally sunlight. Now what happens is in an eclipse, in an eclipse what happens? The moon comes between the earth and the sun. Uh, remember, what light reveals things in darkness? Moonlight, which is actually reflected sunlight. Now the moon comes between earth and sun. Now what happens is because the moon comes in between earth and sun, the first thing which happens is moonlight is no longer available. Even in daytime, the shadow of the moon will create a patch of darkness. We will feel suddenly the sun has become dark. The sky becomes, if you see a solar eclipse, for example, and it becomes dark. Everything seems to dark for a while. So like that, when the mind is absorbed in Akhandakara Vritti for a moment, um, you lose sight of the world. Or if in Nirvikalpa Samadhi, for example, you lose sight of the all external world, body, mind, everything. And the moonlight, it's still there. The sun is shining on the moon. The moonlight is still there. Will you say that the moonlight is illumining the sun? Moonlight, where is it going? It's going back to the sun. But is it illumining the sun? It would be silly to say that the moonlight is revealing the sun. Remember, at all the night we were depending on moonlight to reveal things on the world. Just like that, can we say moonlight is illumining the sun? No, it's impossible. First of all, the sunlight is a million, million times brighter than the moonlight. It does not require moonlight to illumine it. It's millions of times brighter than the moonlight. Um, and the second thing is, the moonlight itself, though reflected back to the sun, is nothing other than the sunlight. It's, it's, sunlight, it's, it's its own light, it's sun's own light. More important, most important, the sun is Swaprakasha, self-illumined. Why did we need the moonlight to reveal things to us at night? Because all these objects were um, dark. They were not luminous objects. That's why we needed a source of light to reveal it. But the sun does not need a source of light to reveal it itself. It shines forth with tremendous light. It pours forth light. In fact, it is the source of all light. Similarly, all the time in ordinary epistemology, when we know things in the world, it is you, the consciousness, shining forth, shining on the mind, illumining the mind. This illumined mind, whatever these comes in the mind, is revealed by the um, the light in the mind, the reflected consciousness in the mind, just like the moon reveals the dark earth at night. But when the, like the moon turned towards the sun, in the, in a, on a particular occasion, very special conjunction, when through Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, through a consideration of the Vedantic teaching, your attention is drawn, just like your atten my attention is now being drawn to the book, I'm getting a book, Akara Vritti, when my attention is drawn, drawn to the Pratyak Chaitanya, the consciousness within, how is it drawn? Drigdrishya Viveka, Panchakosha Viveka, Vasthatra Viveka, any number of techniques you can use. 
to draw your attention to the inner consciousness, this, this awareness within. When it is drawn, if it clicks, if it happens, the lucky conjunction of the planets, if it happens, falls, everything falls in place at that moment, you become aware of yourself, Brahman, nothing, no, no object, Brahman itself, your own real self, capital S, shining forth with all the light of the universe. Everything is there. It just shines forth. It does not require the mind to reveal it. Uh, so it, it becomes, um, it's a tremendous, shattering, life-altering, permanent uh, breakthrough. You realize it was always there. How come I never saw it? It's like waking up from a dream. You can understand why the Buddha is called the Buddha, the awakened one. You are awakened now. And you can see there's no possibility of going back to sleep anymore. It's so obvious. And, and you are that. Now Vedanta says, you know, like, yay, well done, congratulations, you are illumined. Just a couple of quick observations, you know, uh, the fine print here. Notice what happened. You had to do the um, chitta vritti. That was necessary. You had to withdraw your attention from the world outside and take the help of a Vedantic methodology like Drik Drishya Viveka or Panchakosha Viveka or whatever it is and notice and try to notice at least. You make a vritti in your mind about Aham Brahmasmi. You know, Tattva Masi creates that vritti in your mind. Once that vritti is created, Notice another thing which happened. You did not require the reflected consciousness to illumine this vritti. Uh, this vritti was about Brahman, Satchidananda, your real nature, which is shining forth all the time. There you don't require any other vritti. That simply, Americans have a good expression, mind-blowing experience. It is mind-blowing. You begin to see everything depends on it. It does not depend on anything else. All the light in the mind, all the light of the senses, everything was coming from it all the time. And you are that, that inexhaustible source. So, technically, back to our technical words, in ordinary knowledge, vritti vyapti is required, phalab vyapti is required. Vritti vyapti is required to remove ignorance about the object of knowledge, and phalab vyapti is required to illumine, prakasha, give the first person experience, what David Chalmers calls the first person experience. Uh, that is ordinary knowledge. In illumination, Brahma Jnana, enlightenment, what happens is Vritti Vyapti is required. Uh, that is the whole purpose of our Vedantic study. But it is required or not to reveal Brahman, not to know that you are Brahman. It cannot reveal Brahman. It just is required to take your attention away from the world. It's just required to turn inwards. Just required so that particular movement of the moon to come in between the earth and the sun. Remember, at that moment, the moon is turned, so to say, the bright face of the moon is turned away from the earth. So there must come a time when we let go of this and we are suddenly overwhelmed by the inner awareness. So Vritti Vyapti is required for illumination, Brahma Jnana. But Phalab Vyapti is not required. This is the difference Tremendous difference between Brahma Jnana, enlightenment, and every other possible kind of knowledge or experience. Every knowledge is in the mind. Every other possible knowledge. Or it is colored by the mind. But this one is, it uses the mind to overcome ignorance about the reality, and then the reality reveals itself. There the mind has no, no further role. Now, one more question remains. So what happens after that? After that, you realize not only that you are infinite consciousness, all that is experienced in that consciousness is not apart from that consciousness. It's not that it's like a light. Like, so the sun and the world example, sun, moon and world example breaks down here. Imagine there's only the sun. Imagine that there is only light. Kashmiri Shaivas have a very beautiful expression. Prakasham prakashate, light shines. Or even literally, literally the shining shines. So whatever you are experiencing in that light, that is also nothing different from that light. They are not two things, the light and that which is lit up. Right now there's two different things. There's a light here and this lighting me up, the body. But it's not like that. Uh, Brahman is the only reality and whatever appears is also not different from Brahman. It's an appearance of Brahman. 
it seems different. People and bodies and minds and objects and universe is not different from Brahman. When the ignorance that created this difference is smashed, then all sense of difference goes away. You realize that there is only one unbroken reality. When there's only one unbroken reality, this differentiated world which we are experiencing, you will continue to experience. The moment you open your eyes and look back, the moment the solar eclipse is over, and you look back in the world, you will see everything as it is. But you no longer regard it as real anymore. This is called Badha. Badha is a technical term in Advaita Vedanta, which means even after the destruction of ignorance, all the products of ignorance, like this universe, they keep on appearing, but they are falsified. It's like the mirage. Mirage is a good example. You realize there is no water, but you look back upon it, it looks like water. It's like the blue sky, in, uh, blue color in the sky. You realize there's no blue color out there, but you look up in the sky and what do you see? A blue sky. Similarly, you realize there is no separate reality called the universe. There are no houses and roads and people, and, um, bodies, coronavirus. Not really, not in that ultimate sense. But uh, it still appears. This appearance is called Badha, which is... Uh, the appearance of the universe is a technical term, anubritti. but anyway, we can just call it Bada. Bada means falsified. Falsified. You're still experiencing the universe, but it is falsified. Further fine, um, fine print. If everything is falsified, what about the mind? The mind is also falsified. What about the person? The person is also falsified. And then the knowledge this person had, I am Brahman, what about that? Does enlightenment continue? Do two things continue? Brahman and enlightenment? Brahman and knowledge of Brahman? Do two things continue? No. That is also falsified. But be, be careful. It's not a false knowledge. It's not saying that now I realize I'm enlightened. I realize I am not Brahman. Because the knowledge I am Brahman is falsified. No. It just means it is not a separate reality called knowledge. Brahma, Kara, Vritti. I am... Brahman, this knowledge is there. No, that also goes. Goes means badhita, negated, falsified. Falsified means it continues to appear. World will continue to appear. Body will continue to appear. Mind will continue to appear. The knowledge that I am Brahman will continue to appear. All of it is not real for the enlightened person, including the knowledge that I am Brahman. That's why the mysterious thing, you know, that enlightened people, they keep saying that I am not an enlightened person. I am not a knower of Brahman. Nisargadatta's um, uh, scolding. You're insulting me by calling me a knower of Brahman. I'm not a knower of Brahman. I am Brahman. That's literally true. Every one of us can say that. Even now we can say that even if we don't feel it or realize it. But it's true. Knower of Brahman means what? I am this person who has a mind. In the mind there is a vritti vyapti about Brahman and a phala vyapti revealing it and I have a knowledge. I am Brahman. Not in this way. That kind of knowledge is possible when I say I am Sarva Priyananda. That is an information generated by my mind, Vritti Vyapti, and reflected consciousness reveals it, and I get the knowledge I am Sarva Priyananda. But underlying all of that is the continuous gushing forth, blazing forth of um, this undifferentiated consciousness. That is not a knowledge. You cannot, the enlightened person cannot even honestly claim that I know it. It's not, it doesn't feel authentic to the enlightened person. So does the enlightened person then not know it? We get confused. There's no question of not knowing it. It is the most unmistakable thing for that person. Um, we are calling that person a person. So now when we look at it, so all of these things we have to put together, vritti, vyapti, phalap, vyapti, all, it's all going to come up now. Um, Putting them all together, what are the elements we have got? In ordinary knowledge, you need vritti vyapti and phalap vyapti all the time. Otherwise, you will not get the feeling of knowing something. And vritti vyapti destroys knowledge, it destroys ignorance, and phalap vyapti illumines the uh, object of knowledge, illumines that object of knowledge. Whereas in Brahma Jnana, enlightenment, vritti vyapti is necessary to destroy ignorance. About what? About my nature as Brahman. That ignorance. Ignorance in the mind is destroyed in the mind by the vritti, vritti vyapti. 
is akhandakara vritti but phala vyapti is not necessary that um, illumination by the reflected consciousness not at all necessary and after this realization the un- the ignorance is falsified and all the products of ignorance are falsified though you continue to experience them including the knowledge in the mind that is also falsified it is uh, so this is the basic um, you know the few elements which you have got so far so it says satu chit pratibimba sahita sati pratyagabhinnam agyatam parabrahmam vishaykritty tad gata agyanam eva badhate so this vritti vyapti uh, so the brahmakara vritti or akhandakara vritti um, together with the reflected consciousness in that vritti it makes brahman an object within quotes you cannot really make it an object but in the sense of you know when you are studying vedanta sara upanishads shruti uh, you are trying to understand who am i so in that sense it is made an object by making it an object what are you trying to do vritti vyapti and what does that vritti vyapti do tad gata agyanam eva badhate it negates the ignorance about brahman where is this ignorance in the mind it remo- removes that ignorance then what happens when the ignorance is destroyed um then what happens patakarana tantu dahe patadahavat just as uh, the if you burn the threads of a piece of cloth the cloth is automatically burnt the threads are the uh, material cause of the cloth the material cause is destroyed the cloth is destroyed similarly the material cause of the universe is agyana or ignorance and that is destroyed the universe is destroyed but destroyed in what sense it's not pounded into dust or into subatomic particles or something it is it says badhate negated falsified you have the mithyatva drishti that this is an appearance though it though everything appears different there is difference between you know all the entities of the world really there is no difference just as if you watch a movie and you find so many entities in the movie there are actors there are plants and animals and cars and places and uh, sorrow and happiness and you at, at the same time you know it is all badate negated because you know it's not really there it appears in this way the entire universe just as a movie appears on the screen and everything in the movie is unified by the screen unified means the underlying one reality similarly entire movie of the universe appears in consciousness and is unified by the underlying consciousness which you are so patakar patakarana tantu dahe just as the cause of the cloth threads are burnt if the threads are burnt patadaha cloth is burnt similarly akila karane agyane badhite sati in the cause of the entire universe which is ignorance when it is negated very interestingly he uses the word badhita he does not say it is destroyed or gone forever badhita means negated falsified then tat karyam akhilasya badhitatva the product of that ignorance is this entire universe it is negated negated means you will continue to experience but you realize it's not real yeah. then what will happen special mention tad tad antarbhuta in that entire appearance there is one special appearance called your mind and in that mind there is one knowledge called i am brahman akhandakara karita chitta vritti which is which is the cause of this conflagration what happens to that chitta vritti rapi badhita bhavati that is also negated that also is part of the illusion this is what we get from this is a very very dramatic um all right i'll take it up next time let me see if there are questions krishna murti vishwanathan asks why doesn't sakshi illuminate, uh, illuminate the pustaka akar vritti directly but needs the chidabhas as an intermediary yes the directly it cannot cannot illumine um because from the perspective of the sakshi there is only the sakshi pure consciousness the entire appearance is in maya so maya that means once maya is there subject and object appear now the subject must know the object through the means of knowledge 
underlying all of that is one um, i'll give an example you are dreaming and in your dream you're taking a walk and you see other people walking they're walking their dogs maybe and their buildings and their streets and there is honking going on a typical manhattan scene you're walking now if somebody asks you do you see all this yeah so you see yeah do you hear the honking yeah how do you see um, through my eyes how do you hear through my uh, how do you hear through my ears but yet you are dreaming the whole thing is in imagination in your mind why do you need ears or uh, eyes to see or hear things there you see uh, in your dream also you you split yourself into subject and object and once you are a subject and there are objects and they feel different from you then you have to deploy a, sen- a set of dream sense organs to know those objects you see what i mean ultimately it is the dreaming mind which is knowing everything ultimately it is sakshi alone which is knowing everything but once subject object are differentiated the subject becomes what is called the knower pramata and the object becomes what is called known prameya and for that you need sources of knowledge pramana to generate knowledge and the interesting thing will be in your dream also very interesting in your dream also there are things which you are seeing and there are things which you are not seeing you are quite aware i'm walking down the street there are a lot of things behind me which i am not seeing you don't feel they're all popping into existence the moment i look at them you get the feeling of being in the world nothing weird about it so there are known things and there are unknown things and then you can make the unknown thing a known thing by turning around and taking a look at it you creating a vritti vyapti so in the same way in this world also moment you see yourself as an as a subject with the body and the mind you have to employ uh, the instruments of knowledge to know things one slice by slice one by one and um, there will be things which are known things which are unknown the unknown will have to you have to destroy the ignorance by creating vritti vyapti which will be revealed by the reflection of the sakshi in the mind or in the vritti so it needs a chidavas as an intermediary then next question can we say that chidabhas a reflected consciousness needs subtle matter to be manifested while all the computers are made of gross matter this is why they're incapable of ever having a first person experience exactly why do we have subtle why do we have first person experience because if you say consciousness atman it's there everywhere in the computer also there's that same atman must be there haven't you just said atman is all pervading so that one existence consciousness bliss must be in every computer also so why don't they have first person experiences but they don't have a subtle body um so if you can generate a subtle body somebody asked me that uh, so we are talking about artificial intelligence these days what will it take from a vedantic perspective what will it take for an ai to become conscious i said if you can provide the ai with a subtle body it will become self aware there are many many questions everybody sort many people more or less understand the problem that the ai we are talking about will it be self aware will it be aware like the way we are aware what will it take so right now the understanding is maybe complexity um, many different kinds of um, theories are there maybe recursiveness but multiple theories are there vedanta says in fact not just vedanta almost all of indian philosophy will say the subtle body sukshma sharira is necessary what is that sukshma sharira it's made of subtle matter what is subtle matter i don't know what is subtle matter how the, how do you map it to modern physics i don't i don't think yet we have any cognate of subtle matter yet but it's, it's a very that's an area of of uh, research that is it should be in principle empirical findable testable rama says vritti vyapti and phala vyapti can be explained with relation to any object seen but how do we explain this relation to a feeling for example when somebody is terrified pretty easy when i'm terrified i'm scared of something anxious anxiety or fear so there is a vritti in the mind fear vritti what is the content of the vritti fear and the feeling that i get the first person feeling the texture that feel of being scared there's a difference between the first person experience and the nature of the feeling. i get the same first person experience when i'm delighted i get the same first person ex- first personness is the same everywhere 
but the content of it changes fear delight pain pleasure you see what i'm saying can you make a distinction between the first person experience and the content of the first person experience imagine a time when you felt scared shocked imagine a time when you felt happy pleased the shocked feeling and the pleased feeling are different from each other one is the content is different but there's one thing which is similar to both both are first person experience so the feeling of direct i am lit up by this experience there's no there's no language fails there basically but this is now being recognized more or less there are reductionists who try to deny the whole first person problem but um, more or less modern thinkers not just chamas um, uh, christoph koch and a number of others are also uh, beginning to recognize that this is the crucial question of consciousness studies girish says in near death experiences described recently by swami mahayogananda what is it that escapes the body witnesses the scene and returns to the body subtle body with the reflected consciousness when the physical body is dying at any time and, and, and you don't have to be advaitic about it any um, um, school of indian philosophy except the charvaka so any school of indian philosophy in fact any religious any theology whether it's christian or muslim or judaic they will all they all talk about a ghost body about a subtle body about a finer body all of them without that you cannot have religion tell me one religion which does not talk about that something which survives physical death so this subtle body is the one which escapes or which survives the physical death then the near death experience will be like this only that the subtle body through that in any case right now also it's a subtle body which is experiencing things it just requires the mechanism of the physical body but maybe the subtle body has its own powers which it can use at its temporarily without a physical body without the physical body it can't interact with us but who is to say that it is not experiencing continuously itself without being able to interact with us may rodrigo says may it be possible that machines mimic a human body so well that allow a subtle body to inhabit it that's a very good question actually i have even thought about that but who knows what is which in which respect do they have to mimic us one um, i think dr anil said to somebody who was a neuroscientist in england he said very nicely look at this crucial point observation he says makes um it does not take intelligence you don't have to be intelligent intelligent to feel pain you don't have to be smart to hurt so he says deep blue the computer is very smart can play extraordinary chess better than all of us but a mouse it can't play chess at all but you can feel pain it can feel hurt physically it can feel, it can suffer the computer can't suffer what's the difference there's a difference it's not a difference of intelligence so one track is making an artificial intelligence more and more intelligent somebody peep, some so some people think intelligence and consciousness are connected may not be you might make enormously intelligent machines which are not conscious and you have a tiny mouse which is not particularly intelligent at all it's still conscious um but rodrigo has a good point can we make machines subtle uh, complicated or uh, or capable mimic in such a way in such a way that it mimics a subtle body then it will reflect consciousness it will in principle that's what sankhya yoga advaita they all agree that if you can have a subtle body in that case in principle if you can mimic a subtle body should be able to reflect consciousness should be that's but as i said mimic what alpana says even after having trying to have akhandavitti why self illumination doesn't happen keep at it keep attending classes we will see we'll make it happen uh krishna murti vishwanathan says in the sun moon eclipse example is the locus of observation changing is it accurate to say that the mind realizes that it is not real in that case it sounds like locus must shifted to the mind to sakshi remember 
ultimately all experience is your experience the experience of sakshi or um, consciousness you doesn't matter if you bounce the light from the moon and illumine the earth it's still actually sunlight really speaking who is illumining the earth at night it is the sun even though the sun doesn't is not seen anywhere similarly in our day to day activities when i'm seeing hearing smelling tasting talking and i have no interest in vedanta absolutely no idea who is it actually lighting up all my world it is the atman it is pure consciousness all experience belongs ultimately to pure consciousness ultimately without it nothing is because without it nothing is possible but yes Uh, for the differentiated experience which we which we see in our samsara uh, the entire uh, set of instrumentation is necessary the whole paraphernalia is necessary but focus one one important uh, thing let me just point out another example which i like um i have given this example at other times when we were little kids at school we used to play this game you know when we had uh, tiffin boxes our parents would pack lunch for us now they would be shiny so after eating and washing the tiffin box we take the shiny tiffin box and you know in this playground you can reflect light they flash the sunlight can be flash you can reflect light even not even up to on your friend's face or if there's a dark classroom from outside the window you can reflect sunlight and it will be a beam of light which goes into the classroom uh, into the dark classroom but because the classroom is dark you can't see inside it if you want to see something you have to focus the beam carefully it'll be like a beam of light going back and forth in the darkness do you get the example which i'm talking about now the sun is there up in the sky blazing forth equally all around but you needed this instrument the the shiny surface to collect a little bit of that light and refocus it into a dark corner now the mind is like that shiny surface and the the dot of reflected light it's like the chidabha the reflected consciousness and the focusing of the shiny surface is the focusing that we do in the mind the chitta vritti the vritti vyapti what we do with our sense organs with the mind all of that we are trying to do when you say i'm trying to pay attention when i'm trying to see i'm trying to listen all of this is focusing that shiny surface we're trying to focus the shiny surface that is called vritti vyapti and the beam of light from that shiny surface that is phala vyapti now what about seeing the sun itself if you turn around and the little tiffin box turns with you and you look up and then the sun is shining forth with millions of times more light than the little dot of light on your tiffin box it's not required anymore but you need to turn around if you keep focusing your tiffin box in different areas you will not see the sun itself yeah so that's an example all our worldly knowledge is trying to use collect the light of the sun on my tiffin box and focus it on different things but to see the sun itself you need to turn around towards the sun the turning around towards the sun is accomplished by vedanta by tattva masi by adhyaropa pavada by drig drishya viveka avastha traya pancha kosha all these methodologies drawing your attention towards certain something once it's done properly that certain something takes over you don't need any more effort any uh, any any more books and efforts or techniques the sun cannot say i am lighted because it's a light itself brahman light yes kiran says for vritti vyapti chidabhas is not required or needed correct the vritti is a natural modification of the mind that happens by itself without chidabhas yes but remember the moment you say mind and vritti chidabhas is automatically there if you have a mirror your face will be reflected in the mirror hmm. mirror does not require your face no doubt but it's natural drigdrishya viveka we read the connection between the reflecting medium and the reflected uh, object is is uh, swabhavika sahaja this sahaja face and mirror reflected face and mirror original face is this and mirror is there reflecting medium the reflecting medium and the reflected face what is the relationship not with the mirror and the original face no relationship but the mirror and the reflected face what relationship natural so whenever you say vritti vyapti 
Chidabhas is implied because the mind is functioning, reflected consciousness, consciousness is always there, automatically so. If Rick says, wouldn't all matter animate or inanimate include a subtle level, but some, somehow in living system, subtle matter is organized so as to allow experience, just as the gross body is organized to allow experience. Correct. But the subtle body, which is the capacity for reflecting um, consciousness, just as a good example would be in the world outside, everything reflects sunlight, everything reflects sunlight, but certain things like a drop of water, a dew drop, will not only reflect sunlight, but you'll have a perfect little sun image formed in that, which also shines, which has some of the properties of the sun. It's not the sun. Similarly, Chidabhas is not consciousness. It's a simulation of that. It's a channelization of that. It has some of the properties of consciousness. You feel aware. But it has the unique property of being used to reveal things. But yes, it's there everywhere. Because everything is made of five panchabhuta. So the sukshma panchabhuta are there everywhere. But they have to be organized into the subtle body for them to collect and focus consciousness. Let me see. Anuradha raised her hand first. <coughs> Pranam Maharaj. I just, I just want to uh, say something and you may correct it. That with the tat Tuamasi, we know that Tat and Tuam are the same. The Jiva and Ishwara is the same. So that doesn't really tell me that I am that Ishwara. So for that reason, we need to do the Aham Brahmasmi and then this vritti bhakti and we don't need the follow bhakti for this but if we do enough of this vritti bhakti then the um, thing will come no what you do is this when you say tattvam asi that thou art uh, we are told that that means ishvara god saguna brahman i am the jiva sentient being now the whole process will be go through, which we all went through, because immediately it does not make sense. How can I be God? Uh, the difference between me and God is so tremendous. Then I'm forced into what is called uh, Tatpada and Tvampada Shodhana, the analysis of the words, in order to find out a meaning which will fit. As you said, Tat and Tvam are the same, that and thou are the same. How are they the same? Because they don't seem to be the same. So to find out how they are the same, you go through this process. What is the process? We now look at ourselves. I, this body, mind, Sarva Priyananda, am I Saguna Brahman, Ishwara? No. No, not at all. Then I must locate the meaning of the I, which, which fits with Ishwara. What is the meaning of the I? It is not the body, not the mind. So I go through that, that process, Pancha Kosha Viveka or whichever, any of the uh, processes which will lead me to the, uh, what is, uh, that, that process we went through semantically, bhaga tyaga lakshana, or jahad ajahad lakshana, the implied meaning, which implies only the consciousness aspect, the sakshi chaitanya. That sakshi chaitanya is the same in me and in Ishwara. There we are the same. So this, you might say that this, that thou art is a very roundabout way of pointing out this truth about us, ourselves. But that's how the whole Upanishadic literature comes together to make this make sense. You have to stay with that, that thou art. The Aham Brahmasmi will become clear to you. Once the Aham Brahmasmi becomes clear as a result of the that thou art uh, teaching, then you stay with the Aham Brahmasmi. The Aham Brahmasmi will make sense only when you have realized yourself as the witness consciousness. If what is Sakshi in our own body-mind composition, the Sakshi is, becomes clear to us in the mind. Then you stay with that, that is called Brahmakara Vritti. So when you say that with the Tattva Masi, um, I know that it is the Chaitan. How do I know it's my Chaitan? Like what are you? I, I, that's, that's the part I'm having trouble what with. What is my Chaitanya and anybody else's Chaitanya? Chaitanya means awareness. That's why I always look at it experientially. When you say body, what do you mean? 
Don't think about it uh, theoretically. Body here. Look, here's the body. Look at it. And then next, transfer your attention to breath. <sighs> Something subtler and more inward to the body. Look at it. Not theoretical. Then look inwards. The thought about the breath, which is the manomaya kosha. Not theoretically. Just feel, yeah, I was thinking. That thought. That is thought. That is mind. Go deeper, the intellect, again experientially, not theoretically. Then beyond that, if you reach, you'll reach a blankness, the Anandamaya, again experientially. To whom or what are these five koshas being revealed? That is consciousness. That's not even my consciousness. I am consciousness. Don't even say my consciousness, my consciousness, my Atman. Otherwise, what will happen is my Atman is fine, but I have many money problems or I have many relationship problems. No, you are the Atman. And as the Atman, you have no problems. You have to admit the Atman is fine. Atman has no problems. In that case, if you, had, if you see yourself as the Atman, don't force yourself. Let it become obvious to you. Yes. At that point, I see there is no problem at all. Once the breakthrough is made, we will see. Once the breakthrough is made, our attention will be drawn to the fact that that reality which you have intuited, does it have any problems? No. Are you not that? Yes. Even after that, problems will continue. At the level, if the mind has not been purified sufficiently, the mind will tend to drag you back. It will attract your attention back. Then the, then the practice will be nididhyasana, staying with what you have discovered. Stay with it. You have a tremendous advantage over the rest of us uh, who are still struggling our way upwards. If you've reached the peak of the mountain, don't be in a quick hurry to come down from the peak. Stay there and enjoy the view. Right. So that's what you have to do. Shavani? Pranam Maharaj. Uh, when, uh, whenever I hear that um, machines, intelligent machines don't uh, have first person experience, subtle body, and I, I keep asking that how to prove it because, um, you know, in Hindu mythology, we have so many examples of inanimate objects revealing, uh, manifesting consciousness to certain people like saints and sages. And even if you take the example of Dakshineshwar temple, where we have an image of Kali, it's a stone image, inanimate, no subtle body. But then Sri Ramakrishna sees, um, actually uh, sees divine mother who talks to him and he, uh, like full consciousness, blazing consciousness. How, how to explain that phenomenon? It's not a phenomenon. It's the noumenon. It's the ultimate reality itself. So Sri Ramakrishna sees it, not just in an image. Sri Ramakrishna would see it in every yes. image and without yes. the image in the entire universe and because Sri Ramakrishna has discovered that. If you discover it, you will also see it everywhere because that is the ultimate truth. But at the Vavaharika level, at the transactional level, right now, at our level, you are looking at me, you feel a certain awareness within yourself. And you forget the entire um, the spiritual world and all of that. Just right now, you feel a certain awareness within yourself. Do you think that the laptop you're looking at has that kind of self-awareness? It doesn't. It's a machine. You will say, how do you know? I know because even the IBM people or the, you know, like whoever, Apple people who have made the machine, none of them will ever claim that our machine has self-consciousness. This, this doesn't seem to be any evidence of that. I wonder, does it depend on my, uh, my consciousness or the machine's consciousness? How, how, how does it work really? Like it depended on Sri Ramakrishna or some saint's experience uh, for a stone to uh, reveal consciousness. All right. Now, let me put it this way. Let me take an Advaitic ap uh, approach. Sri Ramakrishna did not see any consciousness anywhere. He did not see any consciousness in the stone image, in Kali, anywhere. If it was consciousness that he experienced, it was his own consciousness. Consciousness can always be, can only be first person. Can you ever experience, what would it be like to experience consciousness as an object? If you say, I'm experiencing consciousness as an object, then you don't know what you're talking about. 
you're talking about the mind you're talking about animate behavior but that's not experience of consciousness a robot can walk around what is the experience of consciousness shravani right now where are you experiencing consciousness are you experiencing consciousness in us or even the subtle body in a uh, uh, the no wait 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 take it slowly are you experiencing consciousness in us no no we don't seem conscious to you are we zombies i i think the root of consciousness is in me root or whatever consciousness is in you and not only that consciousness is you see where do you experience a book here i'm showing you a book where do you experience a computer look look you're looking at a computer where do you experience a body you look at your own body you can see experience a body look at your own breath you'll experience breath look at your own thoughts you'll experience thoughts if you are a telepath you can experience our thoughts also but awareness you can only experience in yourself where else impossible right if you see awareness outside it is something else that you are seeing if you see it it's not consciousness it is consciousness which is seeing right so we cannot have a blanket statement that inanimate objects do not uh, do not have a subtle body and uh, cannot manifest consciousness because- inanimate objects by your definition inanimate mm-hmm. it means without prana if you, if you translate <laughs> without prana means prana is a component of a subtle body you just said we cannot make a blanket statement that objects without subtle bodies do not have subtle bodies of course you just made the statement yourself yeah in theory but the all these empirical examples in our mythology and most recently like in shri ram how to explain those i mean uh, these are empirical uh, uh, examples before us so true so it does not mean that the that the rock had a uh, hidden uh, subtle body it does not mean that vedanta would not say that it means ishwara is present everywhere so an enlightened person would feel the presence of ishwara everywhere in the animate and inanimate but as far as we are concerned in our day to day activity there is a clear difference between the animate and inanimate the animate are what we call jeevas inanimate are what we call just uh, jada vastu yes yeah, so rama touches a stone and then uh... not all stones huh not all stones all stones are not ahalya right so there's something special uh, I, i mean but that happens right it uh, there is it could be it could be there could be a, a you know in the far future maybe uh, our subtle body can be downloaded and kept in a computer chip and science fiction talks about it quite possible but then that still does not mean that every uh, entity every physical uh, object in the universe has a subtle body inside there's a ghost sitting inside it no ishwara is there everywhere there's no doubt about it yeah. the manifestation aspect so uh, it depends it's it's not uh, for some special cases like saints and uh, what vedanta is saying is where is consciousness most directly obvious to you in yourself in your own experiences focus there don't keep looking for a stone which will jump around even if you do what good does it do to you suppose sri ramakrishna saw that he did what good does it do to us it did no good to him also he just saw the same divine mother which he saw everywhere but the consciousness which you are if you notice the nature of that you will be free of suffering that that's the whole purpose of it This is the whole purpose of our exercise here. Then, so uh, Shekhar, do you have a question? Pranam Swami Ji. So my question is, uh, although for the purposes of teaching, this Mahavakya is explained in a certain way, uh, but if and when I realize this Mahavakya, hmm. is it more precise to say that I will have realized that Brahman alone is and I am not? i am not is a peculiar statement i means this personality called shekhar uh, is not correct but what you will realize is jeeva brahmaiva napara 
the reality which is you, it cannot be denied. When you say I am Brahman, it means Brahman is you and you are Brahman. I realize that I am not, only Brahman is. Then who is the one who has realized it? So for, for me to realize that I am Brahman, I have to come down from that, uh, that oneness to a little bit lower level, right? Because I have to feel my, my ego after experiencing that Nirvikalpa Samadhi, for example. You know, we are not talking about those things here. You're saying that this pointer that you are Brahman, you are already Brahman. You are that. You are under this cloud of ignorance which makes you feel that I am not it. That is dispelled. That cloud is dispelled by this, these teachings and the fact that you are Brahman is absolutely clear to you. Whether you are in Nirvikalpa Samadhi or not. In Nirvikalpa Samadhi, this realization it will not be there. You need a thought for that. When the mind fun starts functioning, the question is, is it true that you are Brahman? You will say, yes, it is true. At least to yourself, you will say, it is true that I am Brahman. That is the reality about me. Thank you. Srinivas? Yes. Yes, Srinivas. Yeah, pronounce Swamiji. Namaskar. My question is, Swamiji, when uh, the mind is contemplating on I am Brahman, occasionally when the mind is very pure, very sattvic, uh, this Brahmakar Vritti arises in the heart, and effortlessly, since you know, Falabhyapti is not there, so without your effort, without the ego being there, sometimes momentarily the flash comes in the heart. You, know, you have that experience, the flashes of uh, I am Brahman thing. I don't know whether it is called Brahmagar Prithi or not. So, does it, I mean, can we say that you need to have so many such Brahmagar Prithis appearing in the heart to ultimately culminate with the final knowledge? How does it happen? Uh, the final knowledge is that it will never go away anymore. Uh, so the Brahmakara Vitti, if it is truly Brahmakara Vitti, even one instant is enough. And after that comes, it is always there. But what we just saw is that it becomes Badhita. Every Vritti becomes Badhita, every knowledge becomes Badhita, and the Brahmakara Vitti also becomes Badhita. So now, will you need to stay with that knowledge? That is Nididhyasana. You need to stay with that knowledge, that, uh, that Brahmakara Vitti, which is Badhita also, in order to purify the mind in order to remove, technically, in order to remove what is called Viparita Bhavana. The contrary tendencies in the mind are purged by staying with the realization that I am Brahman. But if it is like a flash, you feel something, feel a sense of oneness, you feel a sense of an intuitive understanding. Those are good things, but those are like experiences in a sattvic mind. They come and go. Yes. One, one sign of a real Brahmakara Vitti would be that it will its effects are irreversible. You don't feel that I had... An That's intuition. what I thought. That's what I thought. Brahmakar Vritti comes once. It means it happens once. Yes, it happens once. It doesn't, ha it doesn't happen many times. It happens After once. After that, it will remain, but it remains in a sense, as it we just read, in the Badhita, as a falsified, as an appearance. Okay. So the kind of thing which happens automatically without any effort. Sometimes it happens. You feel something where you... The moment you try to that's catch a good thing. it goes. That's a, that's a good spiritual insight. And, but if it ever gets clouded over, if it is ever uh, doubtful again, if it is not helpful for me to uh, answer my questions, illumine the at least the Vedantic texts, then it is not really Brahmakara Vritti. Yeah, that's once what I once you yeah. have it, all of this will become crystal clear to you. Uh, all these, uh, you know, with at least the non-dual texts. All right, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting comment. Alpana says, I think Sri Ramakrishna did not experience subtle body in Kali image, but the pure consciousness itself everywhere. No, no, no. This is what you must realize. <clears throat> pure consciousness is never realized as an object. The moment you say, I saw pure consciousness everywhere, you did not. Whatever you saw, it was not pure consciousness. Swami Bhuteshanandaji put it so clearly. I just was reading a few days ago. I'll tell you in Bengali and then translate. He says, Brahmo Brahmo gyan hai, Brahmo darshan hai na. You get knowledge of Brahman. You don't get a darshan, a vision of Brahman. The absolute reality is realized, is intuited as I am that. That's it. It's not a specific mystical experience. The moment you have a mystical experience like Sri Ramakrishna had, that's an experience of God, of Saguna Brahman. The presence of Ishwara everywhere. 
And Sri Ramakrishna also had the Brahma Karavritti and realized that I am Brahman. But that's not, you know, like I feel my, what would he say? I see Nirguna Brahman everywhere. Not at all. You would say I feel the presence of my divine mother everywhere. Everything is feels. This feels awareness, not as an object. Only the names and forms are objects. He says it's soaked in awareness. That awareness is he himself. So anyway, the answer to the comment here is that no, pure consciousness, you have to be careful. Pure consciousness is not an object of uh, experience. It is the one which is enabling all experience to happen. I'm choosing my words very carefully. Okay. Now let us bring it to a close. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Rama Krishna Rupa Namastu Stay with this question, what is consciousness? I'm telling you, in most of our 99% of cases, when we talk about consciousness, we're talking about the mind, some subtle functioning of the mind. The moment you understand, really, really understand what is consciousness, enlightenment is one step away just. That, that step will be, I am this. That's all. So stay with the thing of, of what is consciousness. Then all these questions will become, ans will, answers will flow easily after that. Yes. Very good. Jai Ram Krishna.